We've seen this before. The man dubbed the founder of psychiatry by the psychologist Ising. We've seen how he was educated under people like Paul Fleshing in the mental diseases are the equivalent are the same, are actually brain diseases, and how that was part and parcel of his upbringing. The kind of thing that was able to anatomise, dissect the brain and identify what they thought were lesions creating certain conditions. And we know how successful this was in, for, for example, identifying Alzheimer's. But we also know how unsuccessful this kind of method was in trying to pin down schizophrenia, say, as a brain disease. We know as well that Kreppelin can't use the microscope. He's got problems with his eyesight. And when you bear in mind that the techniques, the discoveries that are illustrated in an image like that require the detailed expert use of the microscope to undertake so that the tissues that are being examined can be interpreted, can almost be read. The things that need to be stained are stained. It is a very expert skill and it requires, or it required certainly at that time, good eyesight. And he wasn't quite as blind as a bat, but he couldn't see very well at all. He starts off in his professional career training as an alienist, aiming to work in asylums, treating mental illness within the walls of asylums. However, he quickly gravitates towards the university sector. And you'll remember that at this time, universities in Europe, particularly the German-speaking lands, but right the way up into Scandinavia, are becoming increasingly interested in developing clinics that sit aside the departments of psychiatry that are within the academy. This is how, for example, the Berkholzli in Switzerland clinic uh, commenced as an adjunct to Zurich, Zurich University. And this is the path that Kreppelin is beginning to follow. And his first professor, professorial position is in Estonia, of all places. By 1890, he's been appointed professor at the University of Heidelberg. And there he does what all ambitious men do, whether they're working in the Wakefield Asylum in England or they're working at Trenton in New Jersey. He assembles a team of the best and brightest that he can get hold of to work on the scientific basis of psychiatry, to do that kind of histological analysis that he himself has been trained in but cannot do. However, unlike Niesel and Alzheimer, who are in his clinic, he starts going off on a slightly different tangent a more interesting tangent, a tangent where he becomes concerned that we don't even have adequate con uh, descriptions of all of the different conditions um, that are expressed in mental illness. He wants to pin down a whole raft of things, what the symptoms are of specific conditions, but also what the prognosis is. In other words, if we think, we know, we diagnose someone with a particular condition, then we're also going to know how that condition is going to pan out. We're also going to know the natural history of that particular condition. The natural history being the way the condition would run without any form of intervention. And then the way that it does run once you take step A, B, C or D, once you implement the clinical plan that you have for treating these conditions. So he started working at building what, for want of a better term, ought to be described as a database 
a database before computing, a database that would allow him to explore the full experience of mental illness and the effects of its treatment. There's the Stella team. I went a bit ahead of myself. We've seen that before. So, as I'm saying, he's interested in human psychology and psychiatric prognosis. And he develops a method that is going to be, to some degree, critical when we arrive at that juncture where people like Spitzer are looking to put DSM-3 together. From admission, each patient is assigned a card admission into the clinic, into his uh, clinic. And the symptoms and progress of the disease are recorded. The life details, the vital statistics, the family information are all recorded with a particular focus upon the outcome. And he's hoping that using this method, he's going to be able to, for once and for all, pin down what the mental illnesses are, to identify them, describe them, and then work further on treatment. So his method is very descriptive. It's very observational. It doesn't rely upon the kind of techniques that we see going on in the laboratory. It requires observation. It requires listening. It requires detailed note-taking. It requires a day-to-day -day minute observation of the changes in the particular conditions as the patient is treated. It is, in every respect, a deeply clinical method. And at the same time, he begins to build up a picture through this of symptoms and the way that the symptoms begin to cluster together around what he regards as certain conditions. And as he goes on, he becomes increasingly less interested in the causes of mental illness, which has really been one of the major aspects of the way psychiatry has been driven up until this point. Increasingly less, uh, uh, less interested in etiology, and more and more in diagnosis through observed symptoms and prognosis. Now we know that he's building on the work of others, that he's building upon observations that have already been made, that the method isn't new, it's just he takes the method to another level. And in the process, he distinguishes, he believes, for once and all, on a descriptive basis, manic depression, what we would call bipolar, from dementia precox, which is later rebranded schizophrenia uh, by Eugène Bloiler, working in Switzerland. And I would suggest as well that it's this method of description, this method of looking for clusters of symptoms that drives the people that decide to create the DSM. And we'll see how that process works in a minute. But there's no doubt in most people's mind, including the minds of the people like Spitzer, that they were inheriting their methods from um, Kripalin himself. 